Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who can make it today. Um, and thank you for joining us for our California e-bike incentive project work group. Uh, my name is Sean Ransom, and I am staff lead over the California e-bike incentive project. And I am joined today by my supervisor, Sam Greger, who manages our suite of shared mobility projects and the uh, e-bike incentive project as well. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go over some logistics for today's discussion. And as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. We anticipate a copy of the recording will be made available on the Low Carbon Transportation Investments and Air Quality Improvement Programs meetings and workshops webpage uh, in approximately two weeks. Um, materials for today's work group are available on the same webpage, and a link to these materials uh, will we'll drop in the uh, Zoom chat in a minute here. Additionally, today's meeting is being translated live in Spanish. In a little bit, you will be able to access the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. And for Spanish speakers, please join the Spanish channel, and the meeting will be translated into Spanish. And please be mindful when speaking so that the interpreters can translate everything. Uh, we will not be using the Q&A box today, and that feature has been disabled. We will be leveraging Zoom's raised hand feature to facilitate comments and questions. And for those comments and questions, please remember to state your name and affiliation when making a comment or asking a question. If there are Zoom disruptions for any reason, including malicious intent, we will immediately end today's meeting and send out another notice to reschedule. And lastly, we are unable to allow anonymous meeting participants for security reasons. Please make sure your name is clear on the Zoom platform. If you have called in, we will adjust your phone number and call on you if you raise your hand based off the last four digits of your number. Uh, I'd now like to pass it over to Marco, our translator, our Spanish translator for today. Thank you, Sean. Just some reminders on how to access the Spanish language channel for those who are attending in Spanish. Para aquellos que nos acompañan en español, queremos dejarles saber que tenemos interpretación al vivo para la sesión de hoy. Y para escuchar el programa en español en breve, aparecerá en la parte inferior de su pantalla un icono con un globo que dice interpretation o interpretación. Seleccionelo y de ahí seleccione el idioma Spanish o español. Y de ahí podrá escuchar todo el programa en español. And please note, uh, for those listening to English, interpretation services are being offered for today's session. To listen to any comments or questions that are given in Spanish, you can do the same. Please select the globe icon that will appear at the bottom of your screen in just a moment that says interpretation, and you can select English. And you'll then be able to hear a live rendering of any comment that comes from Spanish into English. Thank you, Sean. Back to you. Thanks, Marka. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, one second, having a technical difficulty advancing the slides. While we're waiting, um, thank you all for uh, participating today. Um, for those of you that have sent in emails, we've received a high volume of them, um, but we are planning on responding to all of them um, just in time. Just give us a little time. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick and bring it right back up to see if that resolves the issue. Okay, there we go. All right, so the purpose of today's work group is to present and discuss the final proposed project guidelines for the California e-bike incentive project. Um, this webinar is the final work group of a series that started in 2022. And the guidelines presented today are based off of feedback from the general public and stakeholders 
And today we'll go over the final proposed eligibility criteria for applicants, e-bikes, retailers, and funding, and also comments from today's work group will be considered before finalizing the program. Okay, so for the agenda today, um, we will briefly touch on the solicitation process and recap the timeline on how we got here, talk about the program goals and eligibility for applicants, the funding amounts and proposed set aside for priority applicants, um, what e-bikes are eligible and how retailers can participate, the application process, um, and also a soft launch proposal, and finally, the timeline to implement the program. <clears throat> so what is the California e-bike incentive project? Um, it's, it's a California um, statewide consumer facing incentive program that aims to provide Point of sale vouchers for eligible electric bikes, also known as e-bikes, to low-income Californians to encourage adoption of e-bikes as a replacement for motor vehicle trips, provide access to clean transportation options while offsetting vehicle miles traveled. And a little bit of the background on how we got here. Uh, the e-bike incentive project was established by CARB in November 2021, and we have held three public work groups on solicitation development and three on the program implementation. We launched the competitive solicitation for an administrator in April 2022 and announced the winner in August 2022. Um, the grant has been signed by the grantee, Pedal Ahead, and they begin work on December 1st, 2022. And we are still aiming to launch the consumer facing program around the second quarter of 2023. All right, let's move into the program eligibility requirements. So to be eligible for the vouchers through the e-bike program, uh, we are proposing that eligibility, el eligibility uh, requ requirements be for California residents who are 18 or older um, and have a gross annual household income uh, that is less than 300% of the po federal poverty level, or also known as FPL. And additionally, only one incentive is available for individuals. And for incentive amounts, based on feedback from our previous work groups, uh, we are pr proposing incentive amounts of um, $1,000 as a base voucher amount. Um, an applicant that meets the basic eligibility requirements would be eligible for this amount. Uh, an additional $750 for cargo or adaptive e-bikes and an additional $250 for applicants who have one of the following that apply, um, that either live in a disadvantaged community as defined by Senate Bill 535, or live in a low income community as defined by Assembly Bill 1550, or who have an income equal to or less than 225% of the federal poverty level. Um, so in total, an applicant could receive a voucher ranging from 1,000 uh, 1250 1750 or $2,000. And so here we have the most recent income thresholds for 2023 based off of household size. Uh, so for example, for a household of one, the applicant would need to make uh, $43,740 or less to be eligible for the voucher. 
Um, or for example, a household of four, the income would need to be $90,000 or less. Um, and I will note that these slides will be posted. And for more information on the income thresholds, uh, you can please visit the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the link below. Okay, so what's covered by the voucher? Um, vouchers will cover eligible e-bike purchases. Um, and I'll talk more about eligible e-bikes in a few slides here. Um, the safety equipment, such as helmets or locks, um, and also adaptive e-bike enhancements. Uh, vouchers will not cover, uh, for example, rider visibility gear, such as reflective clothing or headlamps, um, and also e-bike enhancements, such as fenders or racks for carrying cargo. Okay, so moving on to program funding. So we have 7.5 million total for e-bike vouchers. Um, we're gonna have two rounds of, of funding, um, which is split by uh, 2.5 million for all eligible applicants. This includes uh, the basic eligibility applicants who meet the 300% federal poverty level and priority applicants, um, which I'll talk about in a few slides here. Uh, once that is reserved or exhausted, then uh, the remaining 5 million set aside will be only for priority applicants. Um, and I'll show that in the next slide. I'll also note, uh, we, we don't have a time limit for the funds, so it's all dependent on how quickly the funds are reserved. So for the $5 million set aside I, I referenced in the slide above, um, applicants eligible for the set aside will need to fulfill one of the following criteria. Um, either they reside in a disadvantaged community or a low income community. Um, and I provided a link here uh, for folks to check out a map and see how, where their residence is. Um, um, have an income at or below 225% of the federal poverty level or participate in one, of, one or more of the public assistance programs on CVRP's uh, clean vehicle rebate programs categorical eligibility list. Examples of those are uh, Section 8 housing or the TAN, TANF benefits. Okay, so for e-bike and retailer eligibility. Okay, so we're proposing that um, based on the comments and feedback from previous work groups, uh, we're proposing that uh, all of the three e-bike classes as defined by AB uh, 1096, and those definitions are class one limited to a top speed of 20 miles per hour with pedal assist only, class two limited to a top speed of 20 miles per hour, uh, but have both pedal assist and the throttle, or class three have a top speed of 28 miles per hour, but with pedal assist only. So in addition, in addition to the classes of e-bikes, we're also proposing that the e-bikes uh, must have integrated front and rear lights and must be fully assembled upon delivery, whether that's through the bike shop or a, um, another service that does, does that. Um, minimum one year manufacturer warranty on electric components. This could include the battery, the motor, or the display on the e-bike, to name a few. And then examples of non-eligible e-bikes, um, used e-bikes, conversion kits, such as hub motors or mid-drives, um, 
or e-bikes outside of the three class system. Um, full suspension mountain bike, e-bikes, uh, and scooters and mo mopeds would not be eligible. Okay, so we're also um, looking at retailer el eligibility. And uh, we understand the chain supply struggles that e-bike manufacturers and most industries have uh, experienced throughout the pandemic and which are still ongoing. Um, and in one of the first work groups for this project, we discussed limiting retailer participation to only local bike shops, but heard from a lot of you that we should include online e-bike retailers as well. So as a result, staff is suggesting that we work with both local bike shops and online e-bike retailers with a physical presence in California. And as here on the slide, by physical presence, we mean that there is either a physical shop um, that their manufacturing is done in California or that they have a corporate office in California. Additionally, retailers must ensure a process to sell an e-bike fully assembled and the ability to provide repairs and maintenance. Okay, so with that, we'll take a couple uh, comments and questions. Uh, I would remind everyone to please use the raise hand function or number two if you're calling in by phone and to please state your name and affiliation before asking a question or making a comment. All right, Sean, I'll uh, open it up to, and if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Um, Danilo Lontok, um, you um, now are able to unmute your phone or your computer. Um, I think you need to unmute your, your computer, Danilo. Okay. Um, We will come back to that person. Okay, next we'll go to Sal Lichen. Hi everybody, uh, this is Sal Lichen. I'm with Specialized Bicycle Components. We're headquartered in Morgan Hill, California, and we're one of the leading brands and manufacturers of bicycles uh, in the world. Uh, I've got a few comments and questions, uh, a number of slides. I'll try not to take too long. Um, first one on slide seven, talking about the income requirements. Um, I, I've said this before in these meetings, I'm, I'm concerned uh, at the 300% the, uh, of the federal poverty level. I just compare it to the clean vehicle rebate program, uh, which is at 135K for a single person. Uh, in order to reach that level of income under this program, it'd have to be a family of seven. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I, I'm concerned one, at just general eligibility, and two, at the message it sends that we're we're so much more incentivizing uh, complete, you know, electric cars and vehicles than, than electric bicycles um, at this level. Uh, on slide, uh, a couple of my questions are just around uh, the specific language. For example, on slide 10, you, you mentioned that, you know, it's certain safety equipment's available, like helmets, um, but not visibility gear. I just I think it's important if we're going to offer feedback that we see the specific language you're proposing so that we can offer offer feedback on that. Mm -hmm. um, on slide 15, um, uh, I'm just a little curious about uh, the fact that uh, e-bikes must be new. I mean, we only sell new bikes, so that's in my interest. But I would think if the goal is to get folks of lower income, um, there are very reputable bike shops who sell very reputable pre-owned bikes, just like someone might buy a pre-owned car or something. So um, might be worth considering how that how that could fit in. Um, 
on slide 16, similar question about specific language on the assembly. I, I think that'll be important to review. Mm -hmm. And I just want to offer a comment that um, you says no full suspension bikes. I, I, I'm sure that's intended to make it so people aren't buying like recreational mountain bikes under this program that they're used for transportation. I definitely support that general idea. I just want to say that there's a, a new trend known as SUV e-bikes where they do have full suspension, but they are made for commuting purposes. So um, again, thinking, looking at that specific language, you might want to take that into account. Um, and then last comment on the slides we've seen so far on the next slide, slide 17, also just keen to see some specific language about um, the uh, ability to provide repairs and maintenance. Uh, again, I think that's just important to, to review, especially in light of those on like online e-bike retailers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. We'll revisit some of the that language. And a lot of that will be um, available as we develop the website and um, our implementation manual as well. All right. Now I'm going to, um, Melissa Costa is next. So I've unmuted you. You just have to unmute yourself. There you go. Great. Thank you. Yeah, my name is, uh, I'm, I'm Hugh Costa, Melissa Costa's husband. Uh, she got called away to her work, and I am also interested, very interested in this program for both myself, my wife, and my children. Um, I echo the same sentiment as the previous gentleman from a consumer standpoint, is that, um, for instance, all sorts of areas in California, Sonora, all kinds of areas, it would be in commuters' best interest in a lot of areas of California. We are not a flat state. This isn't, you know, uh, Santa Fe and that kind of thing. Um, and full suspension, uh, to his point, has become absolutely common now, uh, at least front suspension. Full suspension is becoming more and more prevalent. So really changing that uh, as long as it, it is a commuter bike, which is your goal, I do understand that. But being more flexible on the full suspension, I think, would be gigantic for this. Um, the second one, knowing and working with a lot of low-income families, the additional cost of, of having it pre-assembled is really prohibitive for people in the lower income bracket. And I know, again, not only is your goal to make these uh, commuter bikes ex uh, accessible to lower income, but make it out to as many people to take advantage of this as possible. And I really think m forcing these people to have to pay an additional fee to have it, maybe one to $200 fee to have it assembled for them when it isn't really that hard. I've seen a ton of them and it isn't that difficult to assemble. I only imagine a very, very small percentage of seniors not able to possibly put it together. So that might be something to be looked at uh, also that I would hope you would look at because I would be one of those people, even though I'm not financially, um, uh, you know, at, at the lowest level, uh, I still absolutely avoid those kind of fees at all possible to be able to afford an e-bike. I've waited for many years to get into e-bikes um, and I ended up uh, cutting a corner and buying a $650 uh, conversion kit for my son's regular bike so they can go back and forth to school and a part-time job. So, um, yeah, and I uh, then then now I've led to a question. That's all my commentary for you to please, please absolutely take note of and consider. But the second part is um, this is only for buying bikes for commuting. It doesn't apply to, say, conversion kits to get more people to go electric. Is that correct? That's correct, Hugh. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, and there is no, uh, uh, can, well, then that could be something considered a much smaller credit for something like that so that you're getting as wide a swath as people to uh, switch to electric commuting. Because once they own these little kitted ones to their existing bike, they'll get addicted and want to buy a full bike. And so please consider adding that as well at maybe a much smaller uh, uh, discount and package since they average anywhere from 200 to $700. Um, that might be something to add to this program. Uh, so that your goal of getting it out to as many people, including low income, which is the what I'm addressing with those kits. I bought the kit because I couldn't afford a normal uh, full electric bike within reason for my teenagers. I was afraid they'd grow out of whatever I bought. So the conversion kit was best for our family for a fit, but I can also see that being a best fit for somebody on a fixed income, like a senior uh, that is low income, who might already have a rascal type of senior bike of some sort. Uh, and the for conversion kits, they take the front hub, and they just have a water bottle that's a that's a battery. It's that simple, and uh, it's it's huge and very helpful, and really would get some of these fringe cases of people with less money really into e-bikes and doing the very thing your program represents. Awesome. Is that something they might consider, or or you just take note of it and think about it later? Yeah, we absolutely take note of this and bring this discussions back to our program admin and. 
talk through okay. the, yeah. Great. Um, and my last thing I was going to say is I don't have access to flip through the, the different slides. I was trying to take note of everything you were saying as you were going, but I was I had unfortunately had to work while it was going on. Is there any way to flip? The, there's only 15 slides. Is there any way to go real quickly through the slides so I can make my final comment or is that too uh, time prohibitive? Um, we have a lot of other people that have their hands raised. No problem. No, I understand. I, I respect that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the. No, time. it's okay. I'll put yeah. the I'll put the link back in the chat box because you may have jumped on after I I put that awesome. in there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, for the thank time. you. Okay. Um, next up, um, Tina Butler. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Tina. I work for Gazelle Bikes North America, based in Santa Cruz, California. I was wondering if there, I've made a few of the work groups, but if there's been any discussion around um, also only allowing e-bikes that are UL certified, um, there's a lot of safety concerns around lithium ion batteries and in some, you know, th <laughs> runway, thermal runways and things like that. So I know we are trying to keep this um, as affordable as possible and the, the higher quali quality certified batteries um, add to the expense, but just curious to know if there's been any discussion around that. Like a one-year warranty on components is okay, but certainly not best in class. And if we're really trying to provide transportate reliable, safe transportation vehicles, particularly to underrepresented people, it feels like a miss to not prioritize well-made, highly serviceable machinery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Tina. We we are considering, um, you know, safety protocols for these e-bikes. Especially, you know, there's headlines. All, all the time with runaway batteries and apartment buildings, things of that, of that nature. Um, but yeah, aligning that with a voucher that can, you know, get the, an e-bike in the, in the hands of someone without any other costs, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to balance that. So it's an ongoing conversation um, and, and we'll definitely take your comment back to, for discussion. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Crystal Brown. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I am one of the people that you're you're targeting. I am disabled. I'm on Social Security, and I'm curious because I filled up an application over a year ago before they realized they needed the third party to distribute the vouchers and um, all of that that happened. And I've been sitting out here waiting for some kind of information as to um, are we going to have to fill out applications again. Are you guys going to honor the original applications? I obviously fit into the low income uh, portion of everything that's going on by, by watching this. I just, I feel like there's been no transparency. I've been, you know, been hoping and praying and waiting that I'm on that list, but I don't know. It's been a year and a half. Um, I, I used to be very, very physically active and I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm speaking for many, many people right now. Um, I've been, I, before I became disabled, I was very physical, physical active. I, I work five minutes away from home. I have to drive to work and back every day because I cannot walk that far. Um, but I can, I can ride an assisted bike. Um, I, I have a grocery store that's two blocks away. I have to drive every time I need some little something because I can't walk there and carry something home. And I think it's ridiculous when I could be out getting stronger and riding a bike and here I am just waiting and I have no idea when this is all going to happen or if I'm even on the list of, of eligible people at this point. And I'm just a little disappointed that it's taken so long. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Crystal. Um, so this program actually hasn't launched yet. Um, we'll be launching later this year. And we don't, um, so I'm, I'm curious as to what program you signed up for. Um, um, it was the original one, uh, the e-bike incentive program. And I filled out the application and then it went away. And then I was told that because you um, you guys didn't have the distributor in place that you you guys um, uh, took bids and got somebody in there to um, be the person the people to distribute the vouchers. But like I haven't heard anything else, and I'm just like, are we going to have to fill out new applications again? Are you guys going to honor the old applicants? I guess that's my biggest question. So that so if you would have applied the only application would have been for the administrator. So to answer your question, yes, there will be a new application that is being currently developed and will be part of the launch. Um, Sean is gonna go into the, the timing of everything in, the, in a few more slides. 
Um, our emails are at the end though. If you want to email us, um, we can get into contact with you and figure out what you applied for. Yeah, I, 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 it was on the Cal bike, the same plate, the same website that I got downloaded for this zoom meeting register for the zoom meeting. And it was, you know, um, apply for, uh, the incentive program. And then I got no information. It just like it disappeared off the face of the earth. So, um, yeah, I've been sitting here in limbo for over a year now, <laughs> hoping yeah. for a voucher for an e-bike at some mm. point in my life. Yeah. Um, please email us and with your contact and we'll be in touch with you. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute Joss Cashon. Okay, I think I unmuted you and then muted you, but you're unmuted again. Here we go, mic check. Yep. It's a little go. quiet. Mm. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll try to speak up a little bit. Um, yeah, my, my name is Joss. I, I'm also uh, probably one of the people y'all are trying to target with the program. Um, I, I live in Los Angeles. I'm a student, uh, partially disabled, low income. Um, got hooked on e-bikes years ago when I first moved here and slowly but surely realized that I could not afford to live in this city and so being uh savvy and uh smart with the 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 investments that I make with the uh the little money that I am able to save up is one of the pretty much the only ways that I'm able to to get by um and uh I guess first of all I I should just say thank you to y'all for putting your time and energy into trying to get something like this together I think it's a great a uh, great idea, great concept uh, to get more people into into this uh, into this. I don't want to call it a, a a hobby. I guess just uh, you know a method, a mode of transportation. Um, but I, I guess um, what I mainly want to echo is just uh, the the sentiment e expressed a, a few callers ago, just about the um, the requirement that the the bike be assembled. I think. Um, you know, uh, I've been kind of getting the getting familiar with what's available on the market for the last few months since I found out that this incentive was in the pipeline. And uh, it seems like most of the uh, most of, of the stuff that's available that's within my price range is stuff that is not going to come assembled. Seems like most of the more affordable bike companies uh, that are on the market are doing uh, direct to consumer, like partially assembled, and you know you gotta put a wheel on or straighten the 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 handlebars or whatever. You know it's a very minimal amount of assembly, and I I will agree it's um it's pretty simple to put these bikes together, and then you know uh, maybe half an hour or an hour of your time, and you've saved a hundred plus dollars. So to me that's a, a no brainer to save a little bit of money like that. Um, and so I do wonder if having that as a requirement may just uh you know add an additional hurdle that's not uh i mean maybe there's i guess i'm I'm curious what the rationale is on that if there's uh you know a good reason to add that additional stipulation to the to the program um and then i guess maybe a similar feeling on the requirement for integrated uh headlights and taillights it seems like as far as some of the companies i've been looking at that's going to put you into a higher price bracket kind of, you know, their more premium offering tends to be the ones that will offer the integrated stuff. Whereas, you know, me personally, I would usually just go for a more low end option and uh, then just get an aftermarket headlight taillight to put on there. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just if you, I mean, I, I'd love to to save everything I can and and, and uh, use the, the program to, uh, you know, to get a rebate back for some of my uh, money that I'm spending, but if it's some of it's being canceled out by having to go for a more expensive bike, then it's just sort of, you know, it's not entirely defeating the purpose, but it's defeating a portion of it. And so, I don't know, I guess I had a question in there, but it's mostly just a comment. <laughs> um, but thank you for your consideration. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Joss. Um, the, the assembly, um, I should that was if maybe I should go back to the slide, but that was for the the um, 
the retailers. And we're trying to look at ways that we can somehow partner with retailers to have that assembly done um, uh, without affecting the price of the bike. Um, so those are all pieces that we're still trying to work out though. Gotcha. Mm. I do like the idea that someone else had to about like a, you know, some maybe possibly lower form of incentive for a kit because a kit is exactly how I got into into e-biking in the first place because that was all I could afford back when I first moved here. And so I, I love that idea. It might be kind of like a, a middle ground. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Josh, for your comment. For sure. All right, I'm gonna, we've got 27 raised hands. Um, so we'll take a couple of more but I want Sean to be able to get through the rest of this presentation, which is just a few more slides. Um, but I'll unmute Kyle Chittock. I am Kyle Chittock, uh, owner of Area 13, an e-bike company, and I have a big YouTube channel about electric bikes as well. Um, I think some of it was just uh, clarification items. Um, some were already mentioned. Uh, one that I didn't see pointed out yet um was racks and fenders seems like there's a little bit of a disconnect because this is targeted towards commuter bikes but it's saying it can't be used for racks and fenders which 100 percent of the customers i have that are buying a commuting bike want racks and fenders um many bikes already come with racks and fenders so it's kind of it's kind of just it doesn't make sense to me um e either include it or what will happen, I think, is companies will just include those items in the cost of the bike and it's going to be covered anyway. So that's that's my thought on that. Um, and then I would uh, repeat the the full suspension aspect too. Um, just being as vague as it is, it's not going to make sense because there are, in addition to the SUV type bikes that are mentioned, there are uh, folding bikes now that have full suspension that are clearly targeted towards the commuter market. So um, I think in a, in a lot of cases, there are bikes that are going to fall under full suspension that are clearly commuter bikes that are being cut out of that. And it just doesn't quite make sense. Um, and, uh, and then just some clarification too, on what integrated front rear lights means. Does it have to be just a blinking light, red light? Does it have to run off the main bike's battery, separate battery, just included? Um, I think just what exactly that means. So we, so consumers know what bikes do and don't qualify. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Yeah, um, these are all definitions that we'll be including in our implementation manual um, before we launch the program. So um, yeah, and we'll definitely take your input and then take it back for discussion. Thank you. All right, um, next is Lucinda Young. Uh, yes, I'm a, a longtime bike commuter and um, interested in getting an e-bike as I am getting older and uh, the hills in the San Francisco Bay Area are getting tougher for me to um, make it up uh, without uh, an, an electric bike. Um, so I've been, um, I'm interested, first of all, in timing. There hasn't been anything discussed yet about timing. You know, I've been following this for quite some time now. And initially, I thought things were, the rebates were going to be available in the first quarter. And now I'm hearing second, and then it was changed to second quarter. So I'd like to get an update on timing. And I'm wondering if the PowerPoint also is going to be made available, since there's some great information on here. And I didn't have a chance to jot it all down. Um, I want to echo the concern expressed by the first speaker about the disparity in the income requirements for electric vehicles uh, versus the, the rebates for, for bike rebates. I mean, the electric vehicle uh, tax credits are, you know, I think it's under 300000 for a married couple. I mean, huge disparity. On the other hand, I understand you only have a set amount of funds available for these bike rebates and you want to reach the uh, lowest income folks first, but um, that, that just, that disparity is a concern. Um, 
And I'm wondering on the income requirement, what evidence are you going to require um, uh, purchasers to present? Is it uh, income tax return? And uh, is income uh, referred to gross income um, as reported on the income tax return? Or you know, what other sources are you looking at? Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucinda. Um, yeah, we are still developing our backend systems for the income verification. Um, and I, I would have to get back to you on what exactly would be reported uh, for the application as far as the gross income or uh, what, what box it might be on the W-4. Or W-2, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, um, the slides that are coming up will explain a little bit more of the timing on this. Um, we wanna make sure that we get a program created that um, that works really smoothly and well, and it's just taken us a little bit longer um, than we have. Uh, regarding your income level, um, all of our programs are moving to 300% federal poverty level, um, CDRP being the one that's still at 400, but that program is phasing out. Uh, thank you for your comments, though. Um, I'm going to open up to Peter Raymond, and we'll do, I think we'll do two more, and then we'll get through the rest of the slides, because the rest of the slides may answer some of the questions, and then uh, we'll open it back up. Hello. Yes, um, Peter Raymond. I'm here in San Diego. We're putting all our bike lanes in, and I did also put in my name probably a year, year and a half ago, and haven't gotten a current status. I'm looking at a foldable bicycle only because I have limited space in my studio. And I also would probably put shock absorbers on even a regular bike. So I would want full suspension and probably would want the fenders and the lights as well. And so um, I don't know where that all sits in your qualifications. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um... Yeah, those are still ongoing discussions, um, you know, also with the idea of, of um, those tend to be extra costs and just trying to get e-bikes into the hands of the uh, applicants. Also, also um, the bike I'm looking at is a 750 watt bicycle. A lot of the bikes were 500 watts, but, you know, as the bikes are coming online, they're they're becoming more quality bikes. And so generally they do ramp up the wattage on them. So I'm just wondering if that will qualify as well. Right, 750 watts would still be eligible. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll do one more and then we'll go back to the presentation and then uh, get through that. So I'll open it up for Laura McCammy. Actually, can you put me back in the queue? Because I have questions about both halves and I can just ask them all after you oh, do sure. the second half. Yeah. Okay. Um, then let's go to Tom Litt. Hello, this is Tom Lent. I'm an e bike project coordinator for Walk Bike Berkeley. And just to wing into my concern about uh, not covering rider visibility gear or the add-ons such as fenders or racks. I think the um, encouraging people to get rider visibility gear, I think is really important for safety. Um, and allowing the addition as a previous caller noted of um, fenders and racks to make bikes. What we want, I think, is not just to get e-bikes in people's hands, but to get functional e-bikes that will replace cars. And so particularly, particularly at racks are really important for that. Without, with, without a rack, you're limited to what you can uncomfortably carry on your back. With a rack, you can take a couple of grocery bags, you know, rack in a couple of panniers, you can take a couple of grocery bags of, um, of groceries from the store and, and it becomes a real functional, um, functional bike for more than recreation for real, um, you know, for real errand running. And uh, that's gonna be a critical critical to get people to take e-bikes seriously. So I encourage you to, to be encouraging that. That's all for now, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, John, do you wanna run through the last six slides and then we'll open it back up? Sounds good. Uh, 
All right. And I think these next slides will answer, you know, help answer some of the questions we had in that last Q&A session too. Okay, so let's go into the application process. Um, so the, the application, application process will be online through uh, our program website. And uh, I would note that the website that we have on the slide here is not yet up and running. Um, it's just a domain name that we've reserved so far. Um, and so applicants will need to follow a few, few steps to receive the uh, voucher approval. Um, so step one would, to, would be to go to our program website, ebikeincentives.org. Uh, step two, create a login and apply online. Um, and you would be prompted to supply your previous tax return and identification in this step. Uh, various forms of identification are allowable, such as a California driver's license, California AB60 license, or California ID card. And additional information may be required if the um, addresses don't match across the documents. Uh, step three would be to find an e-bike uh, and a dealer through the program website to purchase the e-bike. And these will be approved e-bikes and approved retailers uh, that we're going to do a process through for the, the website. Uh, step four would be to complete the e-bike safety and um, environmental awareness training. Um, and this would cover uh, things like um, road safety, um, route planning, um, or you know, uh, visibility. Step five, once approved, you will receive uh, your voucher through email. And then we're proposing that e-bikes must, must be purchased within 30 calendar days of receiving your confirmation email. Uh, and then once you have your voucher, uh, you can redeem your voucher at a, um, uh, and this is redeemed at the point of sale. So the uh, voucher amount will be subtracted from the total sales price. And so here's the voucher requirements. Uh, vouchers must be redeemed within 30 days. Uh, we are proposing a one-time extension um, in the event a specific e-bike is unavailable or the applicant is unable to redeem the voucher. Uh, one-time extension may be requested to extend the 30-day window. And we are currently working to understand issues such as supply chain constraints um, to determine how long the extension will need to be. Vouchers are redeemed at point of sale um, and vouchers cannot exceed the total sales price. And um, applicants must agree to a, a one-year ownership requirement. And so in, in ramping up all of our uh, program implementation, uh, we're looking at a soft launch in late Q2 of this year. Um, and so here is the soft launch criteria we're proposing. Um, and this soft launch would be to test our systems, our application portal, our process, and, and networking with retailers before our main launch. And carbon core collaboration with Pedal Ahead, um, we're looking at uh, these four communities for our soft launch. Um, Barrio Logan in San Diego, Fresno, California, Bayview Hunters Point, San Francisco, and working with California Native Tribal Governments. Uh, we're looking at 20 to 40 e-bikes per region um, and potentially up to 300% for the soft launch, uh, all of that going for vouchers. And again, aiming to launch in Q2 of uh, this year. All right, down to the last couple of slides here. The timeline and next steps, um, we expect to have all the components for the e-bike program finalized in May of 2023. And once we have incorporated final feedback and finished developing the website, application portal and materials, uh, we will begin outreach for the soft launch. After the soft launch, uh, staff and program admin will assess any issues and 
Provided it all goes smoothly, we will launch the program statewide in Q3 of 2023. All right, and that was our final slides with content. We'll open, open it back up for comments and questions. Uh, just remind everyone to use the raised hand function um, and please state your name and affiliation before asking a question or making a comment. All right, so we'll go back to Laura McCann. So I've unmuted you. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Laura McKamey from CalBike. Um, and so I have a, a couple of comments, but I have a, a bunch of questions, so I apologize in advance. Um, great presentation, thank you. I wanna start by saying, I understand that um, this program can't be all things to all people. And there's been a lot of great suggestions, but this is a very small amount of money for the whole state of California. And um, CalBike supports the 300% 300 uh, federal poverty level limitation. Um, and the class one, two, and three e-bikes, um, you know, keeping it to new e-bikes for now. And hopefully we can all keep notes on this and in future years, there'll be a more robust funding and the program can be more expansive. Um, so question, so it said one, you said one limit, limit one incentive per person, are there household limits or not? Oh, we're just doing the in one incentive per individual. Okay, so it, no household limits, great. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a concern about the funding restriction, um, and I'm wondering about the $5 million because it's already a very small pot of money, and it, yes, the 300% FPL is in alignment with the other uh, the EV programs, but I think the restricting two-thirds of it to people at a lower income level or in a higher priority um, uh, location is much more restrictive than the EV programs, um, and I'm wondering if you have any data on how many Californians fall into those. I was looking at the map that you linked to. How many people does that cover? Like how restrictive? I'm just wondering how restrictive that is. I don't know if you have any data on that. Uh, I We don't have any data on that on hand. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I can look and see if I can find that as well. Um, yeah. Totally appreciate that you're including gear in the voucher. Um, I would, what, I guess I'm, my question is sort of in alignment with what some other people said, what safety gear is there besides helmets, if you're excluding things like flashing lights or uh, reflective gear, and I would strongly encourage you to include locks, because that safety has been a huge concern, and locks can be expensive, especially locks that are big enough to uh, secure an e-bike. Um, can be quite expensive. So I think that would be a piece of gear that would be really good to allow people to include if they have money left over in their voucher. Um, and I had a question about that. That it's I think this is just semantics. It said the voucher can't exceed the total sales price. Does that mean you have to buy a bike that is worth at least $1,000 or that you're just not going to get chain? If you buy an $800 e-bike, you're not going to get two hundred dollars back. You're just going to get the eight hundred. Is that is that what you're, that's what you mean, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But but you could use if you bought an eight hundred dollar e bike, you could use the other two hundred to buy gear that was uh, approved. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so the application process. I have some questions about that. Will there's a considerable amount of documentation needed? Will that be available online? I'm, I'm sure you won't op open up until you launch the application, but will people be able to see what they need to gather ahead of time so that they can get their documentation together? Yeah, that, that will all be part of our implementation manual. Um, and I, I do believe we're going to release that uh, through the website before we actually launch the program. So okay. folks will have a chance to look at that, what they right. what need to bring. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is probably my strongest concern is the, is the education requirement. Um, this is a program exclusively for low-income people. If I went out today and bought a bike, I have no re education requirement. I think offering educational materials as part of what the program offers is fantastic, and I'm really glad that CARB is doing that. But I think creating an extra hoop for somebody who already may be working two jobs, maybe dealing with childcare issues or family care, you know, having all sorts of other things going on in their life, I feel like that is um, regressive. And I really encourage you to make the education element optional. Um, just make it a resource rather than a requirement to get a voucher. Um, 
30 days to redeem a voucher, not enough time. I bought an eBay. It took me, I knew what bike I wanted. It took me way more than 30 days. And it wasn't about supply chain issues. It's just a big purchase decision from talking to um, people running other e-bike programs um, that are similar to this. They had a pretty high rate of people not redeeming the vouchers. And some of it was because they couldn't find a suitable uh, bike. And I think the initial window should be at least 90 days uh, at a minimum. Um, it, it's a big purchase. And again, people are busy. They have busy lives. They have work. They have kids. It may take them a while to have the time to find the bike that they want. Um, and um, questions about the soft launch. And if this is too much to answer online, these are my last questions. Um, how are the regions chosen? Are there are, are there uh, local CBOs in each region that that you're working with? Is that is that how that's working? Or yeah, I'll take this one. Um, yeah, there there are communities um, that have historically not received funding or enough funding from us, and so um, we do have community based organizations in those in those regions that we have contacted or are going to contact to um, to to help us with the SOM launch. Um, but they were just selected with an internal conversation. Okay. And so, the, us. and so the 20 to 40 per region. So across all of the California native tribal governments, just 20 to 40 e-bikes. This is just for the soft launch. So the soft launch is really supposed to help us understand um, what's working and what isn't working mm -hmm. with the application process, income verification, um, the dealership mm -hmm. network, um, at the training that you mentioned, you know, does it, is it helping? Is it not helping? Um, and the purchasing and voucher redemption process. Okay. So it's, it's like a data collection opportunity for you as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've learned in the past when we open programs up, you know, fully before testing it out, um, there are usually a lot of issues and errors and things that we could have fixed had we done a soft launch. So we're hoping to avoid that when we open it up statewide. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. All right, that was all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully I didn't respond too fast. Um, all right, Allison Holden, I've unmuted your phone. Hi, good, evening. good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, my name is Allison Holden. Can you hear me? Yep. Wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a disabled senior here in California, and I'm really super excited about this. I've been listening to multiple people talk about um, the comparison to the EV program. I, I think that there's absolutely no comparison because anyone who can afford to buy an EV with insurance and all the things that come with it, it is just not a non sequitur thing for this program. Um, I hope that when you consider launching into other areas, that you consider the areas that very low income people live in that we don't always live in the city. Um, I live in a mobile home park near Palm Springs that's literally four and a half miles to butter or milk. <laughs> and not all of us own cars. We do try to car share, but multiple people in my park are very excited about this. And we're almost all of us are on some sort of funding from the state or fed. Um, but please do consider the whole rack thing because when I read it, initially, and you were talking about cargo bikes, it's really tough to get a cargo bike without a rack. And I'm not sure why those two things exist side by side. Um, because again, like the other gentleman had mentioned, for us to be able to get things from the store and back, we need some sort of rack basket, whatever that entails. Um, so thank you for this. And I know we're all really excited. And the, I wanted to mention, sorry, one more thing. Um, I wanted to mention about the paperwork. It is really imperative for somebody like me who's on social security and things like that. It takes us a while, that paperwork from the feds and from the state. And so we want to make sure that we don't miss it. So make sure that those things are labeled up front so people have time and don't miss out on the application process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. All right, next, um, David Reinerson, I've unmuted your phone. Hi there, um, Dave Reinerson from Huntington Beach. 
um, and I'm going to second some of the comments that you, you've heard before, I think. Um, understanding you have limited funding, I understand having the restriction to the uh, FPL at, at this point in time, but I do think uh, with the objective being to, to reduce emissions, that when you get more funding, you need to expand that. Um, the second, I think the, the discussions about fenders and racks and suspension are, are all on the mark, particularly if, if the objective is to reduce car trips. Um, I, I, you, if you're going to do grocery shopping on a bike, you, you need a rack or you need panniers or something of that nature. And since you're specifically giving an, an incentive for a cargo bike, um, then you should actually also allow uh, racks on, on bikes. Um, third, I think, um, particularly since you're saying you are allowing um, direct con to consumer sales, I have not seen a single direct to consumer bike that comes fully assembled. It's virtually impossible. It's going to come in a in a box with probably with the wheels detached and the handlebars either turned sideways or detached. So there's going to be some amount of assembly that has to be done. I don't think that should be a disqualifier. Um, third, um, you know, integrated lights, I think is going to, as was previously mentioned, well, I think it's a good idea. I think it also is going to push you up into higher ex or more expensive bikes. And, and lastly, I think the idea of allowing conversion kits is good because if somebody already has a bike and, and a conversion kit can be adapted to it quickly and easily, that not has two, two things. It also, um, it makes it accessible to more people and it also makes your funding go farther. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, David. Okay, next up, uh, Nicole Burgess. Hi, Sam, and I believe Sean. Thank you. My name is Nicole Burgess. Um, I am down in San Diego with Bike SC, Bike Coalition. I'm an LCI instructor uh, and support Vision Zero safety in, in San Diego and meeting all our goals in transportation. Um, I want to just say thank you. I know a couple of people have commented about lights, but I thank you for the language of integrated lights. Um, lights to me are 24-7. So these bikes, we've heard it's about transportation and replacing the car. So we need all those things that everybody talked about. Um, but integrated lights is just pure safety. So we wouldn't sell a car without lights. So I appreciate you changing the language to integrated. Um, as, a, as an e-bike owner and um, discussion with a lot of businesses, it's not that expensive to actually add the lights. So we can get them. We can get these e-bikes, you know, assembling a bike, that should be changed. Um, we've heard that full expansion should be included. Uh, racks and locks and repairs and maintenance, all that stuff is so important when we talk about, you know, using this for transportation, especially for these low income new riders. So um, really the safety is my main concern for them. And so I really want to know what the reasoning is to allow class three. So uh, 20, 20 is a, I just had a, a, a friend crash on Saturday night and it only goes to 20. So when we expand it to 28, we, we're just putting our riders, our new riders, our, our riders that have never been on a bike, our low income folks to, to just perhaps get a bike that's too fast. Um, I'm not a fan of that, especially when we're trying to create safer streets uh, and advocate for slower speeds. I mean, when you put 28, I mean, that's just a lot of our bike boulevards, 20 is plenty. And for the safety of riders, I'd love to know the explanation of why we are including class three, except for there's a desire for them. I get that, but I wanna know what it is uh, helping in the program for these low new riders. And as far as education, I support education, brief, concise, specific. And uh, I hope CalBike and other advocacy groups can help identify that that resource um, and not just the San you know, California Police Department. So um, I'd love to know that answer to class three. And then just a second question. Um, it's a $13 million program and to only hear seven and a half million is going to e-bikes, that's, that's sad. So. I love a little explanation of where five and a half million is going to go. 
I can kind of understand what the answer is going to be, but uh, if you could help me understand a little better, that would be great. So just those two questions, please. Hi, Nicole. Uh, my name is Lisa McCumber. I'm the manager. Or, Hi, sorry. Lisa. Hi, <laughs> the chief over the Equitable Mobility Incentives Branch, and I've been working on this program and with the, uh, the two different teams now that have ran it over the course of the last year. And just to give you some background, some history on why we ended up ultimately recommending keeping class or including class three in this. Um, we've we've been having we've had a public process for this program for over a year now, and we like today, um, you know, a couple dozen handful of comments, uh, every single work group, very passionate. And we really, we really love working with this group of individuals uh, and the passion that you all bring on the e-bike topic. Um, but we have a, a lot of balancing to do in that. I think somebody said it earlier, we can't with this program, given the amount of money, do everything for everybody. But we heard a ton, just an incredible amount of feedback early on in the process when we weren't including class three that for real potential VMD, VMT um, reduction, we those bikers that are those that are going to use these bikes instead of using their car, many of them will move towards the class three. And that if we aren't including them, then kind of what's the point of the program? And this was debated and talked about kind of at length at many of our earlier meetings um, that we ultimately, after hearing all that feedback, kind of just decided to say, okay, we will, we have heard loud and clear um, a lot more of the public that has come to these meetings asking us to include them for their utility and their purpose um, than to not include them. And so that's that's really where we landed on that was to include them. Um, but as I think Sean and Sam have both covered, we will, you know, we're gonna be monitoring this program. It is, you know, we do only have 13 million to start. And I, I actually, I'll answer your second question as well since I'm on here. Um, 13 million to start, and we know it's gonna go fast. We know that these dollars are gonna go really, really fast. And so we are trying to, again, find a way to balance. Uh, how we're responding to what everybody wants to see us include here in the program, making sure that at the base minimum, we're getting as many vehicles out there as we can, um, and that we're supporting the lower income communities and the disadvantaged communities, especially those that haven't been able to participate in these programs in the past. Um, that's why we are really prioritizing so hard there. Um, but it is going to be a limited program nonetheless, and we're going to learn from this first batch of funding and it may be that if we get new funding coming out, maybe we don't include class three going forward because we've learned that that isn't the right way to go. But at this point, I think the feedback that we've gotten is that that's really kind of critical to some of the core things we're hoping to get out with the program. Um, for your second question on funding, there will be funding from the 3 million, that secondary pot. So we had 10 million, okay. the 3 million. There yeah. will be funding from the 3 million that goes to the vehicles. Um, there absolutely will be. That whole amount isn't going towards running the program at all. Uh, we haven't put it in the grant yet. And so being able to tell you exactly how that breakout works today, um, we can't do. We have the grant for 10 million. So that's all we can really speak to at the moment for what the breakout looks like. Okay. Thank you, Lisa, for the clarification on the funding. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to, you know, uh, yeah, I appreciate you reevaluating it. Class three is just dangerous fast. And I, I personally ride and know a lot of riders and it's, you know, it's, it's a risk and a liability to the state program when, when we are on fast and going too fast. So I appreciate those that want to go fast and when they're, 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 you know, good riders and can go that fast, but uh, our new riders and, and, and within our cities and, and the communities that we're putting them in, they do have no need to go that fast. Our cars don't need to be going that fast. They don't need to be going that fast. Slowly and steady, we get there faster. All yeah. right. Thank you so much, Lisa. You bet, Nicole. And I think the only other thing I'll add on to that real quick is that we really hope that consumers are responsible across exactly. the board these programs, right? Think about exactly. the purchases you're about to make and how they're going to they're gonna work for you. Class three is not going to be for everybody. And we don't expect exactly. it to be for everybody. We really just want to make sure that the consumers that would use it and that it would be beneficial for them, that that, that option is in the mix. Exactly. And that resource book that you have them do it's going to be super important to be yeah. like, okay, you have small space. Get Think about a foldable, which already comes almost assembled in a box. But, you know, so like, yeah, so so, so much potential in that resource book. So really thank you uh, for, for getting this program going and look forward to it rolling out.
Thanks, Nicole. Um, we have 22 raise hands. We only have about 48 minutes left um, on this call. So if you guys um, have things that have already been discussed, um, you know, just let us know. Um, we are taking notes, but with that, I'll uh, open up Brian Cox to um, comment. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting me. My name is Brian Cox. I'm the Vice President of Operations for Jack's Bicycle Center. We have nine retail stores in Southern California. A um, couple of things I totally get and agree with the UL certified uh, of a bicycle that should be eligible for this program. I think it's huge and important. Uh, number two, I'm not sure how you're going to police, I, I, that's probably not a good word, or monitor the assembly of uh, e-bicycles coming from a D to C uh, provider. Um, many of the bicycles that we see that come from uh, direct to consumer are not UL certified. They're not, a, they're not fully assembled. And we find that it's very difficult to service them to get parts and products for them in the aftermarket um, and to keep them on the road successfully. Um, I do have a question and I don't want this to be uh, perceived as intrusive, but as, as a pilot program, are we gonna do any reporting of the use of the e-bicycles by the partic participants at the end of the program? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's something you're considering or not, but I know in Colorado, they did something similar and they had a lot of feedback and a lot of good information that came out of that program. And mm -hmm. I think it might be important for this as a pilot program. Um, yeah. That's Thank all you. I have. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, the, and the answer to that question um, is yes. We are looking at ways to survey the participants, um, uh, even possibly offer incentives for, uh, you know, maybe if they participate in some sort of um, tracking or, you know, or, or report their mileage or something, um, you know, maybe we can incentivize that to some degree. But um, we're also, you know, looking at this from a, a, a program evaluation standpoint um, after the fact, um, you know, are we meeting our goals? Are we meeting our, our metrics? Um, that we lay out in our funding plan and things of that nature. So we, we do have a responsibility to evaluate the program and um, we're definitely discussing, you know, the ways that we can do that. Okay, um, one, one last comment. I think we talk a lot about safety and expecting a consumer to competently, completely assemble a bicycle capable of 28 miles an hour is a stretch for me. It should be done by a professional um, because their a, a, a person is on the road with vehicles going 50, 60 miles an hour and they need a bicycle that is completely safe and assembled 100% properly by a trained professional. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, as far as a 28 mile an hour bicycle, uh, it's critical. Um, I've been commuting by bicycle 20 miles one way for the last seven years on a 28 mile an hour machine. While I'm capable of utilizing it, it's extremely effective to get me where I need to go and it has replaced my car. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna open it up to LaDonna Williams. Yes, good afternoon, LaDonna Williams, with all positives possible. Many of the questions that I had uh, have pretty much been covered by the previous speakers, but I did um, want to ask about the uh, adaptive bike enhancements, uh, since it shows what you don't cover with the fenders and racks under that adaptive uh, enhancements that you do cover, you didn't list them in there. And so was it listed somewhere else where we could read up on that. Um, and particularly we're concerned for the um, disabled population that we serve, um, those racks are very essential for them. 
um, as well as other enhancements that will be needed. So I guess my question on that would be, will there be, uh, or have you considered exemptions for those that have proof, um, you know, that they have a disability, but at the same time, I guess our concern would be, we don't want them to have to be jumping through hoops and loops either to benefit for this, um, with this program. And as we look through, you know, that uh, the program is supposed to be to benefit the disabled, um, the low income population when you add disabled or physically challenged on there as well. I think that there needs to be a consideration as well for them to um, qualify for additional incentives to really help them because the goal of this is to assist those to have a better quality of life. And, you know, I'm also concerned that we don't want, um, because it is to support uh, low income or lower income disadvantaged communities that will be thrown into, you know, receiving the leftovers and the junk secondhand or what have you. And therefore these bikes are gonna be requiring more maintenance, you know, uh, therefore higher cost. Also when it comes to physically challenged um, populations that has uh, cerebral palsy where there, it's limited, you know, um, ability to assemble what might be simple to us is not necessarily simple to those that have challenges. And then my question also would be the chosen areas that you guys are calling soft launch or pilot, I guess, program you came up with, um, you know, Hunter's Point and uh, is it Burial? Burial, Logan Burials, I forget. Yeah, yeah, but right. um, how many low income or disadvantaged communities did staff, because I know you guys mentioned it was a staff decision. How many of these communities have you actually visited? We know you've been to Hunter's Point and Barrow, but there are other communities that have some huge barriers and food deserts where I think somebody else mentioned on here, having to go five or, or more miles away just to get to a grocery store. Like what kind of consideration did you guys really put into just um, as opposed to just being familiar with, oh, this is a disadvantaged community or one that you're very familiar with, how much effort was put into identifying those that get overlooked? John, do you want to address the uh, adaptive? Yeah, comment? yeah. for the adaptive, um, I was just going to state that those will all be um, well laid out definitions in our implementation manual, well identified. Um, and, you know, making it clear and concise uh, for anyone who's looking at an adaptive bike and what type of um, enhancements or, um, you know, uh, modifications that need to be made to it. Okay, you said they will be, so there's no information as of yet. Correct, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we're, we're listening to all you guys' feedback on, on these, so. This is all very helpful. And regarding the four communities, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, how we how we kind of chose them, um, but we are um, definitely cognitive cognizant of those other communities that you mentioned, um, and we're um, working with um, our Access um, Clean California program, which has done extensive outreach to a lot of different communities throughout the state, rural, urban. Um, for the state law, statewide launch, we're going to utilize them along with our other stakeholders and other the other people who have participated in the past to ensure that, in that we get the outreach to those folks prior to the launch of the statewide program. And see, that's the major concern for me because those programs failed these communities, which is communities that I live in and have lived in and very familiar with. That has been a major complaint that we have is that the uh, access or what is that, uh, whatever all the programs are that served the e-cars missed these communities that should have been included in those programs early on 
they've been missed. And that's exactly what we don't want to happen here again is repeating the same thing where you've missed the communities that need the support the most. And in that e-program, which are uh, e-cars, which uh, I'm sure you guys may have heard over and over because we've complained about it, was the fact that you have these uh, disadvantaged programs, yet when you looked at the numbers and you peel back what percentage actually went to the low income communities, CARB ended up being embarrassed. So you don't want to repeat that same behavior with this program here. Totally and totally appreciate that. And yes, we are trying to learn from um, previous programs where we've had those, um, we've missed those opportunities. So thank you. Thank you. Um, next, James Akas. Have I muted your phone? Now you'll have to unmute your phone or your computer. All right, there you go. Looks like we've uh, you've unmuted yourself, but we didn't hear anything. And we're, looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear anything from you, James. Are you there? Okay, let's, let us, I'll move on to the next speaker and I'll come back to you, James. See if you can figure out um, how to get your phone or your computer to unmute. Um, Ashley Garrity, you're unmuted. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Ashley Garrity with the Green Lining Institute. Um, I just wanted to say first, thank you. And um, we're really appreciative of the changes that you've made over the course of the development of this program. And especially for incorporating some of our suggestions for feedback, including uh, changing the set aside and um, prioritizing disadvantaged communities and low-income communities. So I really appreciate you um, taking that feedback. I know there have been some comments about uh, eligibility requirements for income being or wanting it to be higher than 300, but we really support that this is limited to um, individuals and households at or below 300% of the federal poverty level. Um, this is limited funding at the moment, and we appreciate that those funds are being targeted to those uh, households who can benefit the most from those limited resources. Um, yeah, and then just on, on the soft lunch, uh, we do support the approach you're taking. Those are priority regions and um, really appreciate the intentionality in choosing regions that have historically received less funding from CARB programs. Um, we, we would say if there's a high uptake and a high subscription rate to those, we'd love to see it extended beyond the 20 to 40 per region. Um, and then my last comment, which is also kind of a question, is I'd be really interested to hear more about what your strategy for outreach for priority populations are. Um, both, I mean, you alluded to it a little bit in how you're uh, doing the soft launch, but would love to hear more if you have that strategy already kind of figured out. Um, like, are you partnering with organizations? Are you um, sending out mailers? Um, just would love to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we are still developing the education and uh, outreach component of this program, but uh, we are partnering with um, Access Clean California, which is, uh, a, I'm not sure if you're familiar or not with this program through CAR, but it essentially um, has a whole network of outreach um, and it brings a lot of our CARB programs together under kind of one umbrella. 
Um, so within that, we have a large network of CBOs and grassroots organizations that um, we, we already have inroads uh, with into a lot of these communities that we'll be able to leverage for this program. Um, but on top of that, we will be also um, doing an outreach campaign through our e-bike program in, ad in addition to that. Um, but more on that to, to come later. Great, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, we'll try Jane Aukas again. I've unmuted your line. Yeah, the questions I have already been answered because they've been asked by other people. Awesome. I appreciate it. Okay, well, we can hear you now, so. But uh, appreciate you participating today. Thank you. All right, Brinley Edens. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Brinley, and I am with Happy E-Bikes. Uh, we're an e-bike dealer in the San Diego, North County, San Diego area. Um, I just did have a few uh, questions that were answered. One of them, though, was uh, we are keeping an eye on several of the other national and also local incentives. Will they be able to combine this rebate with other, you know, local municipal incentives? Yes, we we are going to allow stacking. Um, the, the only stacking I think we wouldn't allow at this point would be with other car programs. Okay. And then um, just a, a comment, we unfortunately, you know, in this area see a lot of e-bike thefts. So we encourage all everyone that purchases an, an e-bike from us to register both with us, uh, their serial number, and also on the national uh, bike database. Oftentimes, and we've seen examples where you can, we can reunite people with a bike. Um, you know, if a bike is found abandoned somewhere, um, you know, and there's a, a registered serial number. Uh, so I would also encourage that you encourage at the very least for people to register with the National Bike Database because they may be able to, you know, if it does get stolen, um, recover. And I, I would also echo somebody else that said that it would be important to include locks. Um, unfortunately, e-bike thefts are are big, <laughs> big money for people. So, um, and then lastly, you know, we do also offer service through our, uh, you know, we have a bike medic staff. W will there be an opportunity for us to also sign up to assemble bikes within this program for other, other companies? Yes, absolutely. Um, that would be, uh, we'll, through our retailer eligibility, um, and that will all be made available on our program website in the in hopefully okay. next May. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, next is Julie Munerlin. Munerlin? I've unmuted you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Julie Munnerlin from UC Santa Cruz uh, Transportation, and we've been working really hard with our students and staff over the last few months, getting them ready for this program, and it's exciting to see it go forward. We have um, what, what I'd like to emphasize is that we've been working on this for over a year in these programs and these workshops, and I really like where you guys have gone with this. You've come up with some great some great ideas. Uh, we, it's been a mi mixed match of ideas going forward, and it's it seems to have really settled into a, a great eligibility program. It's been said so many times here, but it just keeps needing to be emphasized. There is no money in this program. We had two rebates countywide last year that went within a month's time, and they were both about $3 million. So we have a great amount of disadvantaged 
people here and community zoning in our area. And I'm very satisfied with that so that we can get to the people who need this. I do not agree that we should put all these amenities into this program, accessories, uh, locks. I love the idea. I mean, it's obvious we need these, but most of the bike shops have zero interest bike loans. And those can be used for a 12 month zero interest program to buy any accessory that anyone deems necessary. I highly encourage CARB or CalBike, who has been a great partner with you all, to work with the bike shops who are participating in this program and who are receiving all those wonderful new clients that they've never had come, uh, come together and have an educational part to it, be able to register every bike with any city police registry, and also talk to the people about the zero interest bike loans that they typically all offer. And I definitely love the idea of the integrated bike lights. Most bikes, it seems, have those integrated. I've Excel, those turn on the minute I turn on the power and it's fabulous. Um, and I definitely agree with a fully assembled bike. I have a lot of grad students who are highly intelligent and they cannot get their bike assembled because they are coming in so complicated and they'll have to send them back and $250 later, they get a um, $250 later, they can get a program or their bike back together. So, and it's just safe and, and reasonable to have that kind of approach to it. Um, I look forward to an extension of this program later on for something a little bit more extensive. Um, and if you want to, look at maybe the cargo bike having some kind of requirement that you that it is proven that those cargo bikes will be used for children and commuting needs um, or reconsider that $750 uh, supplement uh, voucher, that would be excellent. Um, but I really think that this program's ready to go and I can't wait to see it get off the ground. And I hope that people also look into their error districts or PG&E programs that are also offering additional, um, additional rebates or voucher programs. So thank you so much. Awesome. Yes, thank you for your comment. All right, um, next, Jeffrey Bruchet, Bruchez. Uh, yes, thank you all so much and so fitting to follow Julie. Thank you for the comment. My name is Jeffrey Bruchet and I am here from UC Davis. Uh, funny to follow a UC with a UC. Um, Julie, thank you for all those awesome comments. I know we talk a lot, so I'm not going to repeat anything that you said, but I share a lot of that same sentiment and uh, we're doing a lot of those same things here at UC Davis. I do want to talk about the safety of, um, you know, when people go out and use these. I think there's going to be a big issue with battery safety. Um, I think it's important that in whatever education requirements that you do, you do very importantly go over battery safety, um, how to charge, why charging it unattended is so unsafe. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of risk there that we as public entities are trying to mitigate. So please pay attention to that. Um, and the other part about safety is to consider uh, the uh, required specification to also include a speedometer. Um, only class three e-bikes do have a requirement for speedometers, but the quality class one and two bikes should also have that. Um, I say that as a manager of a campus with a 15 mile an hour speed limit in our in our campus core, that's to get everyone around safely. A lot of folks on these e-bikes have no idea that they're going as fast as they may be going. So I think it's important that we consider um, what those required specifications are. I'm glad to see integrated front and rear lights. I agree with an earlier commenter that that makes it viable transportation. Um, but I think like you can't have a car without a speedometer. We shouldn't really have e-bikes without speedometers as well. Um, the other part is just a recommendation for CARB is to think about the impact that this program has to our uh, physical environment. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of these higher quality e-bikes go out. Um, and if we cannot park them places securely, I'm thinking 
covered bike storage, bike lockers, um, really high quality bike racks. Those are things that the public entities who invite these bicycle bicycles will need to be deploying. And none of that stuff is cheap. So please consider what kind of programming CARB can do to fund some of those parking improvements. If you build it, they will come, but then we leave these bikes outside to be stolen. Um, I do not want to see these bikes get stolen and go through the hands of a the world that is a stolen bike problem. I think registration is important. I highly recommend the bike index system. That's what we adopted here at UC Davis. It's a great universal bike registration system. Um, and then lastly, just thank you. Um, I know this is really hard work and are running uh, such a program for the state is complicated. I'm really excited to see it coming. Um, I think everything I've seen so far seems well thought out um, and I'm excited to see the money flow. Thank you all. Great, thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, thank you. So we've got 13 more participants um, and roughly 20 minutes left. If we, um, we usually end them when we say we're gonna end them on the notice. Um, so if we don't get to you, please submit comments uh, to our emails. Um, with that though, I'll go to Piet Cannon. Hi, um, this is Piet Cannon from Ecology Action. I wanna thank um, CARB and CARB staff and everybody in this call too for this program and for giving input and developing the program because um, I think it is a great way to increase sustainable transportation, especially people that need it the most. So I'll try and not repeat what's been said already, but there's been so many good things that have been said. Um, and I do want to second some of them, but in, in terms of like my focus is like safety. So starting with education. So maybe there's a way to um, reduce the, barrier of having um, folks, you know, go to a safety training um, that's not too long by having, like was suggested by the CARB staff in your data collection, maybe by having an extra incentive for additional education. You know, there's a lot of new newbies coming to, to the electric bikes. And like people said, you know, biking on 28 miles per hour fast um, class three bikes. So maybe there's some mechanism figuring that out. Um, but I do think that safety education is, is crucial to build both um, safe and competent and responsible e-bike users and people that are going to be on their bikes for, you know, hopefully for the rest of their lives. Um, and, and then also in terms of the safety education, I would, um, you know, ask CARB to make um, avail, you know, kind of utilize the resources available from the League of American Bicyclists. Um, to, to Bikes Belong, to Cal Bike, to all the great, um, you know, bike organizations throughout the state of California and their safety education. So, you know, I, you know, it's great that we have these working groups, but it sounds like, you know, Cal Bike is providing information and input, you know, from this working group, or maybe they could be in a work in a, in a more, you know, direct contact with um, CARB and the e-bike programmer to help develop the best possible um, bike safety education for, for this program rollout. Um, so, and then I just wanted to reiterate one thing that's already been said, and that was about um, the UL certified standard for batteries, because obviously batteries um, catching on, on fire is a big issue. So I, I just hope that CARB has a, um, a way of filtering out, you know, low quality um, bicycles electric bikes that have been, you know, at the center of some of these issues and making sure that they, yeah, that they're not mismatched and, and charged correctly. Um, Cause that's, that's a big key to, um, you know, um, making sure the program runs successfully. So thank you very much for um, this working group and for this program. Thank you. All right, next is Kyler Blodgett. Blodgett? unmuted your phone. Sorry if I mispronounced your name there. No problem at all. It happens all the time. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I'm Kyler Blodgett with People for Bikes with the National Trade Association for the Bike Industry um, and have been following this process since the beginning. Thank you for your time today and your attention as people have said to being adapted to feedback these past many months. Um, I know we're short on time so I'll be quick. I just wanted to echo two specific comments that have already been made. One is about um, allowing full suspension bikes to be eligible. You know, we know that 
for older riders looking for more cushion on their ride for people in rural areas, maybe navigating that uh, unpaved roads. Those are important. Um, so I'll be brief about that. I also wanna echo Laura's point about 30 days being too short. This is a big, uh, sizable, important purchase. And we want people to have the time to find the right bike and you know, get themselves mostly to that point of purchase. And we think 30 days is not gonna be sufficient. Uh, I think her 90 day suggestion is a great one. I have two uh, comments that haven't been raised yet. One is that I think the slides had that uh, you had to be 18 to take advantage of this purchase incentive. We would encourage you lowering that to 16, you know, which is fine with, uh, with California state laws around who can ride an e-bike and what age. It's also what states like Connecticut and Vermont are doing in their programs that are already implemented. Several states are in the bill process this spring. Washington, Oregon, and Hawaii are also lowering that age to 16 for who can be a, a participant in the program. We really think, really think if you're gonna replace cars with e-bikes, you it's a powerful moment to do it at the point where someone's often beginning to drive or beginning to think about how they wanna get around. And we know that obviously that's driving age of 16. So we think that lowering and waiting two years until they're 18, some people will already be taken of automobile culture as we know. So I think that could be a powerful uh, decision moment if we lower the age. The last thing, you know, we're talking about UL safety standards a lot, and I obviously agree that we need to make sure that low quality, unsafe battery um, packs are not allowed in this program. But we also believe that people who bikes that there are other safe standards are besides UL. You know, EN15194 is a great one. And we think the general language around being certified to an appropriate safety standard by an accredited lab gives more flexibility than saying it has to be UL. Um, so, and I'm happy to talk more about that offline if you want, um, but I wanna make sure everyone else gets the chance to talk. So I'll pause it there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, next up, Andrea Harpool. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. And this her husband, you know, we're both, um, uh, senior citizens and we're disabled and um, we both fall under the 30 um, the 30 percent um, federal line you know as far as income and um, we know that we sent in some um, applications and we piggybacking off someone earlier that talked about the application process and our um, one of the applications we filled out was for um, e-bike program that you ride the bike for two years or something and then the bike would be given to you for free if you put so much mileage on it. And um, we've sent an application. We just want to know exactly if someone going to get in contact with us with an application or do we have to uh, follow up ourselves? Yeah, and um, I had a similar question to my email. I'm not sure if that was you or not, but um, I would. I think we should definitely connect um, after this uh, work group and I can help identify what program that um, your that first application was to um, and then for this program which is going to launch later this year it would need to be a new application um, so but I can we can help you um, identify those resources and and what you'll need to fill out that application um, but okay. certainly we're pretty good Sorry, what was that? Uh, I said, we appreciate that, you know, because we've been trying like the other person for like a year or so to get uh, to be a part of the e-bike program. And we're in San Diego and we want, uh, as far as Logan Heights, I understand that's a low line community, but there's also um, people that's um, low income like herself and disabled and senior citizens that we feel that we're a part of that list that would get the first um, bikes, you know, and we, we want to be a part of that, you know, to launch the program effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the next slide, I'll have my contact information uh, after we finish this Q&A. So I, uh, you know, go ahead and write that down or I can, you know, we can get in contact and get you All right, appreciate it. Yeah. All right, appreciate it. All right. Great, thank you. Um, next is Jean Severin Haas. 
Yes, hi, you know. thank you. Um, I'm an independent advocate in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I um, have ridden an e-bike for eight years that I got for helping organize an e-bike rental program, a grant for it, and then the grantor gave me an e-bike. And um, I have a couple of points that I wanted to make. The first is that um, I really highly support keeping a rack as part of things you can fund because in my experience, it's not trivial to add a rack. I've often added had a bike and I go down to my local bike recyclery and it's almost impossible to match a rack and a bike without um, jumping through a lot of hoops. So I, I ask that you please keep the bikes useful for transportation by allowing racks. Uh, the second thing is I found that because the bikes are heavier compared to all the bikes I've ridden in my life, the brakes do need more attention. There's cables that stretch, there's pads that um, get worn out, there's uh, discs that get out of adjustment, there's oil that gets from the hub and using it for a lot of miles. So I was thinking about how, how could you offer a voucher for brakes checks and um, update every six months in the first year? And how would you do that as a, as a safety boost? And could you perhaps make a, a voucher for a brakes um, update when you fill out a survey of your use after six months or a year, or you know, maybe you get a break check update when you pass a safety class. So those are my suggestions and thank you. The program's looking great, really coming together well. Great, thank you. Um, next up is Juliet Bond. Juliet, you'd have to unmute your um, your computer. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Get on Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Going to jump right on in. Do appreciate your program. We have we are also uh, developing a program in tangent with yours. Um, we did have a 2020 program uh, that was fully subscribed very quickly. Um, and I guess, you know, in redoing this program, we went around and spoke to a lot of all of the bike shops, all of the mechanics, and I wanted to um, provide some support for some of the elements you have uh, that, you know, have had some amount of disagreement on this call, uh, you know, the pre-assembled or professionally assembled, I, on behalf of the bike mechanics everywhere, I can't uh, support this enough. Uh, there, while there are some people out there who could assemble their bikes, uh, there, you know, it's going to be a challenge for many, um, for reasons of having tiny precision parts with specialty tools that can be damaged if not, uh, you know, if not the tools are not properly used, the elements need to be torqued to, to certain specs and things need to be adjusted in certain ways that if they aren't adjusted, let's say, you know, derailleur or something, you know, the chain could end up in the spokes and cause a crash. There's just, we think from a, a safety perspective and also from a maintainability perspective, that pre-assembly can be uh, pretty important. But I also just wanted to comment that um, when you buy a bike off of the floor, the sales floor at a bike shop, it is going to be assembled. So really this assembly is mostly speaking to internet bicycles. Um, and that I just, you know, wanted to say that the bike mechanics wholeheartedly uh, told us horror stories about how difficult it was and or impossible to maintain all these uh, huge amount of online uh, lesser expensive bikes that came through in our first program before we um, change it up. And oftentimes they were very difficult to service, requiring lots of time, more time. So the cost of ownership of, an, of a very inexpensive internet bike became actually more expensive over time because of the cost of maintenance that took extra long because oftentimes parts were not available. Um, these companies aren't providing, a lot of them do not provide adequate support for the shop. So a mechanic calls and says, hey, this thing is broken. You know, how do I diagnose or fix it? They aren't able to get through or get callbacks and or the parts aren't available. Some of them came with non-standard wheels. So an inner tube replacement was very difficult. So I just really want to encourage um, and support the uh, brick and mortar shop sales and um, having professional assembly if you're going to allow internet bikes. We also strongly support the UL listing, not only on the batteries, but chargers and the drivetrains. It's become very clear that the runaway fires have a lot to do with these uh, non UL listed or equivalent listing um, safety standards for the batteries. So we think that's a, a really good element to your program. Um, and 
moment, just checking my list. Oh, I wanted to give you a suggestion about the education. One of the things we have put into our agreement with the participating bike shops is that they provide the safety training, including proper charging techniques as part of their agreement to be a, you know, a participating bike shop. And this is something that a lot of them already do. So it's not really um, a huge ask, but I think that would sort of address a lot of people's questions of where is this age education coming from? And is it gonna cost extra time and money? Um, I think that would be a great thing to put right on those bike shops who are gonna get a lot more business as a result of your program. We also suggest uh, potential for requiring them to provide a six month break in tune up since cable stretch and so on and so forth, bike pads, things that need to be adjusted. Uh, the reason that we think this is important, at least in our program, is we, to, in order to maximize the reduction in vehicle miles traveled, uh, these bikes need to last. And so if, it, if people aren't, you know, first of all, if you're not buying a quality enough bike that can be easily maintained, and or if you don't know and or don't want to bring it in for maintenance, you're going to have a bike that's going to perform terribly until people decide to stop riding them. And that's not going to achieve our v VMT reductions over the long term. Um, and I think that, uh, I just want to see if I had any more quick comments. Oh, I think I'll just go ahead and stop there, but really want to support some of the, um, some of the elements you have in your program and also would like to make myself available if you wanted to hear about some of the elements that we've put into our programs. Um, it's, you know, a lot largely based on what happened in our first program, conversations with bike mechanics and also conversations with other program managers um, with e-bike programs. So uh, thank you again, and I'll end it here. Great, thank you. And Sean, do you wanna to go to the next slide? And Juliet, yeah, I would, I would love to follow up with you and learn more. Um, next up is Shepard Ginsburg. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So if you do have, if, you, if we don't get to you, um, please send us comments. Our emails are on there. All right, Shepard, I've unmuted your phone, computer. Shepard, we cannot hear you. All right, let's go to Perry and then we'll come back to Shepard. Perry Warner. Hi guys, uh, Sam Sean, thanks for uh, hosting. Um, I'm Perry, so name is Warner. I'm um, employed by Cake. Uh, we manufacture electric motorcycles and uh, e-bikes, etc. cetera. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, my role is a key account manager, so I work with a lot of bike stores. What's the process for the store to redeem the voucher once they've accepted that from the customer? Yeah, that would be a, an approval process done by the, the bike shop, which would connect with our, um, pro, our program administration um, through, we're still developing the platform on, which, on how that happens, but um, essentially it would be done at the counter at the time of purchase. Okay, so the, the bike store wouldn't need to kind of wait for the credit, et cetera, mm. it'd be an instant kind of thing. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Um, just a couple of observations, really. I know there's lots of people with different backgrounds here um, talking about class three bikes. Um, you know, some people need a class three bike because they need to be able to travel at that speed. But, uh, you know, we have a concern, obviously, that if you want to ride a, a moped, you have to have a license. Uh, and technically a moped kind of does the same kind of speed. So, you know, there definitely should be some kind of uh, online training course, maybe um, as part of the, the training scheme. Maybe it doesn't have to be an in-person course, but maybe there could be an online course with a, a, a pass code issued when you've completed the course in order to get the voucher so that we're kind of uh, inputting some safety guidelines to all these new riders. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I know a lot of the auto programs, you're required to be an authorized vendor in terms of, you know, your car has to meet certain criteria to be part of that um, program and rebate. You know, would, would it not be a good idea to have the bikes in a similar category so that we know that the end users are getting a quality item um, and that would potentially overcome some of these issues that have been addressed in terms of irregular parts or a lack of spare parts? 
um just thinking you know we we have our own workshop you get you know service a lot of bikes ourselves uh and i know we have to have special tools to service a lot of these bikes but you know it becomes you know super important that they're kept roadworthy particularly when they're capable of nearly 30 miles an hour uh, but it's an awesome program looking forward to seeing it launch so uh, appreciate all your efforts thank you great thank you um we'll have enough time for one more short comment i'll throw it back to Shepard to see if you can unmute yourself or if you want to unmute yourself. It looks like you've unmuted yourself, but we can't hear anything. We still can't hear you. Um, if you could send us an email with your comments, then we'd really appreciate it. Um, I'll try one more. Actually, we only have one more minute. Sean, do you want to go through again um, the next steps? Yeah. Okay, just to, to recap. Um, so in May, we'll be finalizing our website and all of our um, application portals, application templates, everything we need to launch the program for the soft launch. And so in June, we'll be doing, we'll do the actual soft launch. Um, and then after our lessons learned and after we've adjusted, made any adjustments, we'll have the statewide launch in uh, Q3 of 2023. And for anyone else um, that we didn't get to, again, please feel free to reach out to us. Our, our emails are here on the slide. I wanna thank everyone for uh, sticking it out and um, coming to us with all these this great um, questions and comments. Um, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our uh, listserv, our Gov Delivery here. And that's gonna keep you up to date on the program launch. Uh, I wanna make sure everyone has um, a chance to keep up to date on our program announcements. And uh, you can also email us at ebikesincentives at arb.ca.gov. And yeah, thank you everyone. We appreciate, we sincerely appreciate all of your time and your feedback on this. Um, you're, you're doing us a big help in making this program the best that it can be. So again, thank you very much for your time. We know it's valuable and uh, we'll talk to you soon. And thank you to our interpreters. We really appreciate it.